Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker Live. Um, had a last minute change on the time here today. Just had some unforeseen scheduling stuff. So I apologize for anybody who thought this was supposed to happen two hours from now. It's happening now. Um, it, today, as uh, my title showed, it's just kind of an open Q&A. Uh, I've had many uh, questions in the past when I've done these live sessions that I haven't really been able to get to, or maybe they've been a little outside the topic. So I frankly ignored them. <laughs> so, you know, let's just uh, have kind of an, an open discussion. Uh, if you want me to uh, walk through something or demonstrate something, I've got a camera trained on the bench here. Uh, we can just talk tools. We can talk woodworking. Heck, you can talk whatever you want. If you have some um, theories about string theory, hey, throw it out. I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, if you don't know, I'm Shannon Rogers. I'm the Renaissance Woodworker, the guy that runs this whole channel. So uh, I am um, looking forward to just having a conversation about hand tools and, and woodworking in general. Uh, lots of people showed up in the chat room. Wow. Hi, everybody. Um, if you have uh, specific questions, one of the things, since I'm the only guy here, there's nobody monitoring the chat, um, put your questions in all caps. That makes them so much easier for me to see, especially from across the room. That's always really, really helpful. So again, if you have a question, put it in the chat room in all caps and I will get to it. But so I guess that's my next point is if you have questions, go ahead and ask them because I didn't plan anything. <laughs> Open Q&A. So until there are questions, you just sit here and I can twiddle my thumbs. You guys could watch me uh, sharpen a chisel, which uh, probably needs to happen. But no, no, I'm not going to sharpen. Watching people sharpen is like watching paint dry. So, um, <laughs> hi, Andrew. Good question. Do I have a favorite lumberyard story? I have lots of lumberyard stories, although, you know, the, the lumberyard employees tend to be kind of the, they get this perception of being kind of grumpy, you know, especially for the, um, the hobbyist woodworker who comes in and feels like they're wasting their time. So my favorite lumberyard stories are generally when the pros come in and are totally clueless as to what they need. Because more often than not, we hear all the time how hobbyists are such terrible customers to the lumber yard, but the hobbyists know way more about wood than your average pro. So um, I had, let's see, wow, where to even begin? Oh, uh, I had a guy who was a, uh, a a, I say a small wooden boat builder. He built small wooden boats. He was actually a pretty sizable wooden boat builder. And um, he was convinced that I was, that myself and our VP of sales were just lying to him that wood moved. And we were talking to him about um, some of the, the steps that he would take because it was going to require shipping the wood all the way down to Florida. And this was in the fall here in Maryland. And, uh, you know, of course, dramatic humidity difference down in Florida. And we were kind of explaining to him, you know, it's going to come down there and it's obviously going to be a big climate change. So you might want to give it some time to kind of acclimate. And he's like, what, you think it's going to miss its home or something? And we just thought he was joking. And then it suddenly came out that he had no idea that there, you needed to worry about wood movement at all. And he was taking all of his, his decking and it wasn't thin stuff. He was buying teak decking and he was also buying a, um, a Sapili decking and three quarter and one inch thicknesses. And he was just epoxying it down, like epoxying it down to an Akume plywood substrate. And he, and I said, wow, you know, how do you deal with wood movement in that case? And he said, what are you talking about? The, the whole boat moves, the wood doesn't need to move. And I, I didn't catch myself in time. I kind of laughed. I was like, ha that's a funny one. And then I realized he was totally serious. And I was just like, mm, crook. I just totally insulted this guy. So then I said, well, you know, wood, wood moves with, with the humidity changes and all that stuff. And he's like, oh, that's an old wives tale. And there was nothing I could do to convince this guy that wood is hydroscopic and it moves with the humidity changes. So I finally asked him, I was like, do you ever have customers who complain about, you know, their decks and like buckling and cracking? It's like, oh yeah, I just tell them that's part of the normal uh, wear and tear of a boat and they need to bring it back in and have it redecked. I was like, so how do you get it up? Oh, I just use like a, a chisel and I hammer the whole thing up and the, the wood just breaks away in big chunks, kind of like peel and paint. And I, I, I think I blacked out at that point. <laughs> essentially this guy and his customers were coming back and getting completely new teak or sapili deck 
put down, and again, these were smaller boats, so it's not like huge sailboats, but still, they were literally chiseling the stuff up because once you put it down with epoxy and put all kinds of coats of stuff over top of it, there's really no way to get it up. So he was just destroying the deck and putting down new ones. So I guess more power to him if he had customers that would go with that. But uh, yeah, that was terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Let me uh, whoop, get that lower third out of the way. So um, Stuart says, I'm struggling with uh, square cuts for dovetails. Any pointers? Absolutely. That's a great question. Let me grab a dovetail saw. Let me change camera angles here um, and get a board. And it's good that you're, you're asking this because frankly, it is the most important part of the dovetail, right? If you're cutting your tails first, you know, you set the angle of the tail when you make that cut. And so maintaining, maintaining that angle is really not important. It is more important to get the cut perfectly square across the thickness. Because if you screw that up, you have a tapered tail. And that is, another word for that is a wedge. And that wedge will end up splitting your boards apart, which is just not good. So, what we can do, and normally I would dovetail on my joinery bench, but that's where the camera is sitting right now, so it's a little bit more difficult to pull it off. Um, I have found that the wider, or excuse me, the longer dovetail saws can be really beneficial here. The new trend in dovetail saws is to have a 12 inch long plate, but it's not totally imperative, but definitely the longer the saw, the, it is a little bit easier to get a straight um, and square cut because you've just got a longer reference point that you can, um, well, reference. Pull this down a little bit. And we'll get in a little bit closer. Too close. Okay, so if you let's lay out some dovetail lines. So we've got a square line across, an angled line there, square line, angled line. Like that. So I've got this line across the board that I absolutely must nail. If that goes off, I'm never going to get that dovetail to fit right. It's either going to wedge the board apart or certainly going to result in gaps. So you want to hit that dead on. So you lay your saw on. And if you guys have seen my whole diatribe about take a step back while you're sawing, you definitely take that step back and make sure that your arm and wrist and everything are perfectly in line. Now, I do not recommend making backstrokes and starting that way. You want to start this cut on the push stroke. So you have to make sure that you're taking all the weight off the toe of the saw so that it will start cleanly on the push stroke. But here's the other thing that's really kind of counterintuitive. People will tend to get a little worried about getting that cut square and they'll kind of nibble like this and nibble the way across. You want to commit to this. You want to line that saw up, take the weight off the toe and push one forward stroke. And this is why that longer saw plate is really helpful. The longer the saw, just the, the longer the reference surface. So you'll notice I'm not worried about the angle of the tail just yet. I'm just taking a light cut to get it settled. Now I'll look at the angle and I've got that cut already established. And I can cut that angle. Same thing over here. Set it on my line. Make, don't nibble at it. Take one stroke, commit to that. And there's my tail. I actually start all of my cuts this way rather than kind of doing this thing. It's take that stroke and really commit to it. Because you've taken the time to align yourself. You've aligned, you've dropped it on that line. You've gotten your body set up a nice wide stance. You've got this arm all set up and everything. If you take a bunch of little nibbling strokes, what you're doing is just inviting error because every time you move forward and back, there's a chance for things to shift and move. There's a chance for your stance to change. 
If you've got it set up nice and square and your body's aligned, just take that single stroke and it will set the kerf and it'll be really hard to jump out of that kerf unless you're like really trying to force it, in which case it'll probably bind on you more than anything else. So with any cut, dovetails, cross cuts, anything, I urge you to really just commit to it. And the more you can start on the push stroke and take that, that really committed stroke, the square is going to be, the straighter that cut's going to be. You can do the same thing with a short saw like this, but again, rather than the nibbling, I'm going to commit with that cut. This is totally the wrong hang angle for this. This saw is really meant for sawing like that. <clears throat> that would be my tip. And it, it is a little counterintuitive because it, it means you need to jump on that and make that cut in one, not fell swoop, but you get my idea. Don't nibble, make the cut, make a full length saw pass. Uh, Ray wants to know the egg beater and brace best drill bits. Uh, Ray, that depends on what you want to do. I mean, for an egg beater, I would just say a brad point bit because an egg beater is really meant for quarter inch bits and under. So brad points tend to work better in wood than a twist bit does, but there certainly are examples for twist bits in wood. Um, so use brad point in an egg beater. As far as a, a brace, if you've got a really deep hole, you can't beat an auger bit. If you've got a really, really big hole, you really can't beat an auger bit, but you need to have a wide swing brace to do that. But an auger bit, because the lead screw is essentially a wedge, if you're working near the end of a board, or especially if you're working in thin stock, that lead screw will split the wood because that screw goes in and wedges it apart. So you need to switch to a center bit. A center bit does not have a lead screw, it just has a spear point. And the center bit, this also works for really wide holes, but center bits don't work well really, really deep holes. They're not very good at excavating the wood like the spirals of an auger bit would do and getting it real down deep into a hole, like think timber frame mortise for an auger bit. But for delicate work on thinner boards and near the edge, you don't want the wedging action. So the center bit is absolutely the way to go. And um, I've got a video uh, out on center bits that talks a lot about this, but in case you don't know what a center bit is, we grab a big giant honking one. This is a center bit. Now it is an enormous center bit, but you can see it has a point. It does not have a lead screw. And specifically, it's a pyramidal point, which if you know what a birdcage awl is, it's exactly the same thing. A birdcage awl has this pyramidal point. And as you, you can cut with it by twisting it, through like a 90 degree arc, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it will keep working its way through the board. And eventually into my bench, which I guess it's not the end of the world, but now I don't want to use a Brad point, a bird cage all to necessarily <laughs> bore through a piece this thick because I've got a three quarter inch thick piece, but I'm almost all the way through with that little birdcage all. It's the same thing, the same geometry on the point. It will hold the bit on its center line, but it's also cutting rather than wedging it apart. So again, that's the best bit for thinner stock. Um, Certainly spoon bits, they have their own little following. They're great when you've got to work or you need to steer, or you need to work in an extreme angle. The spoon bit will adjust to whatever angle you work at. Whereas an auger bit with that lead screw, you drop it really below 45 degrees and it, the cutting lips are hitting actually well before 45 degrees. The cutting lips are knocking that lead screw out and they don't really work. A center bit, they usually have longer lead points. They will do okay at a lower angle. The best bit that I've found for working angles is actually a gimlet bit. And that's not, not a gimlet. And I'm not talking about the drink. This is a, glim, a gimlet. It has a lead screw on it, much like an auger, but it's, it's a hand 
auger essentially. A gimlet bit is very simple. It's got kind of one continuous flute and there's a little bit of a twist. All it's done is you've taken a long piece of steel, you've cut a flute into it somehow, or banged a flute into it, usually with a die, and then you've twisted the end around. So it's literally <laughs> it's just twisted like that, and it comes to a point. This point is nice and long, it hits into the wood and it holds the cut, and you can work at really, really low angles. And the inside of that flute is actually sharpened, so it cuts on its way through. This is what I use um, in boring holes. <sighs> Imagine a sackback Windsor chair, and you've got a hole at the top, holes out here, holes out here. When you come around to the side, you've got to bore a hole at an angle like that, and it sticks in there and it bores right through. So the gimlet bit is fantastic for that. So there is no one best bit. There is a best bit for the operation. You need to choose it from there. Am I missing a bit? Forstner bits, modern Forstner bits, they do work in a bracing bit. Um, depending upon the chuck that is in your bracing bit, you might get a little bit of wobble in it. Um, it's also not the end of the world if you have a little bit of wobble. Um, my bracing bits are a little bit more, or excuse me, my braces are a little bit more modern and they've got a chuck that will hold just a, a regular round shank. They obviously do better with the pyramidal shank of a traditional auger, but um, I can use Forster bits in there. It's a little bit harder because it requires more pressure down, um, but certainly, certainly doable. And then that's a good instance where if you need to drill a flat bottom hole, especially if that hole is gonna be close to the opposite side of the board, the short lead screw will ensure that you don't punch through. Nash wants to know if I have any tips for setting up a Stanley 45 or any other combo plane for tongue and groove. Um, I have spent a little bit of time with the combo plane. This is a, a Stanley 45. It does okay work for TNG. I find that I've, I've much prefer the, the dedicated, uh, what is it, the Stanley 48 and the 49 now, um, or a wooden match plane just because it's a lot more simple. Really, your, your best bet for setting this thing up is, well, first of all, you just don't need all of this ancillary stuff. I've just got it here so that I don't lose it right now. Pull off all the fences. Um, Come on, this thing always wants to jam on me, every single time. It's one of the reasons it doesn't get used very much. <laughs> so my first tip for setup is don't use a 45. No, I shouldn't say that. They're fine planes, they just, they tend to be really kind of finicky because there's just so many adjustment points to the whole thing. So what I do is I'll get rid of the fence first of all because the fence and all that extra stuff tends to kind of get in the way and it makes it harder to see what you're doing. So if you have a board, I'm gonna keep using this little piece here. I would lay it out very much like I would lay out a mortise. So I have a beading bit in here right now. I'm not gonna take the time to change that, but I would set my mortise gauge to the width of the blade And then I would establish, we'll call this my reference surface. And I would lay my mortise gauge onto the wood and then I would lay in the marks for my groove. So now the groove is set to the blade. Move the def stop out of the way here real quick. This is what I'm talking about. There's just so many little bells and whistles and things to adjust on this that just in getting it set up, you're kind of like, okay, move that out of the way, move that out of the way. Now with the fence and everything out of the way, I can really clearly look down and I can see where that blade is. More importantly, I can see where the skate is because the skate has got to ride on the inside of that line you just laid out. And when you've used a mortise gauge like this, you've got an actual physical knife line and you can often set the skate so that it drops down in there or 
If it doesn't, come in and essentially make, whoops, don't do that. Don't blow that out like I just did. You're going to make a little first class saw cut. I'm just making this little V cut here. So it's to the inside of my line. Now the skate drops very clearly in there and it's set up. Slide my fence rods back in. Tighten all the stuff down. You can see how a dedicated tongue and groove plane <laughs> just is a lot faster to set up. The thing that I find more than anything is just how the fence wants to bind, which I suppose is a good thing because it means that it's machined really, really well. It's very, very precise, but man, does it get to be a little annoying. Come on, get in there. Does anybody else run into this where they just cannot get the fence on their 45? It is ridiculous how much I have to kind of fiddle with this thing. And sometimes it actually feels like it's actually sided, which it shouldn't be because it should be identical. But sometimes I just find that it goes on one end of this better than the other, like that. It shouldn't be that way, but eh, is what it is. So now the fence is on here. Slide it back. Again, setting my skate in that line. Now I can press the fence up against it. Against the, the wall, I should say. In fact, I should be doing this on the other side, shouldn't I? Because this is my reference face, but ignore that. So now the fence is actually set so that it will cut the groove as I laid it out with the mortising gauge. That's fantastic. So I would then go and I would cut my groove. Then when it's time, I really need to get my blades out. When it's actually time to cut the tongue, Set my tongue, tonguing blade into the body. I'm not going to do that because I didn't actually set. If I'd set it using the actual grooving plane, we could do this. But since I was just playing make believe, so I would take my grooving blade, I'd set it in the body, and again, removing the fence or at least sliding the fence well out of the way with the groove established you can slide the blade side to side to line it up with that groove. Or if you really want, you can actually take like a small piece of scrap or something like that, stick it in the groove and it will slide into the gap in between the, the, the tonguing blade. And you can slot that down in. So just grabbing a little scrap that's the same diameter of your, um, your groove or making a piece of scrap the same diameter as a groove. It's almost like imagine a key, like a, a key in, in an axle. And you can drop that in and it lines it up and again, it holds it firmly while you slide the blade back in place. Then you grab your, your board for the, the mate to this, the tongue board, and you can go ahead and plane it because you've set the fence with the tonguing blade perfectly flanking the groove that you just cut. You've got it all set up and you know, assuming, actually the other board, the mating board doesn't have to be the same thickness. Assuming you're working off the same reference face, it'll be all set up. So it's, it's, it's a lot harder to describe than it actually is. So the tip is cut the groove first by laying it out off of a mortise gauge. And then once you've got the groove cut, you've got an actual physical thing <laughs> that you can line up your tonguing blade on in order to get that set up. 
line up the blade, lock the fence in, and then go to the next board. And it's really kind of straightforward in that respect. Matt Powell wants to know if I have recommendations on where to get auger bits and how to maintain them. I absolutely have recommendations. Um, Ernie Stevenson lives up in Washington State and his website is grandpaslittlefarm.com. Ernie is a hand tool school member. Actually, he's specifically an apprentice in the hand tool school. And um, he's been providing not only auger bits and braces, but old tools to uh, hand tool school students now for the better part of a year. His stuff is fantastic. He goes way above and beyond when it comes to cleaning up and sharpening his auger bits. He's even been known to craft little boxes that they go in and shipping them off. He's got thousands of auger bits. Um, I know he was in the midst of redesigning his website and kind of relaunching. So I'm not exactly sure where he is on that right now. His website is really not, Ernie, forgive me, please. His website's really not all that much to look at but you can go in, you can look at the tools and see that he has, he doesn't really have a bunch of listed online. The key is to either call him or email him and tell him what you're looking for. He will hook you up, no question. It is the best resource for auger bits. And frankly, you might be surprised what other old tools he could come up with. He has sourced some really weird stuff for some of my students. So uh, definitely check out grandpaslittlefarm.com. Um, as far as maintaining them, um, Occasionally, I will wipe them down with, I use Renaissance wax for rust preventative just to keep the rust out of them, keep running it through the flutes. Uh, it's also nice to just kind of clean off the, um, the threads. So that wax just kind of helps clean stuff out. It just keeps the rust down. Sharpening them, you do that with an auger bit file. Auger bit file is a, um, it's really not as an obscure tool as you might think it is. For some reason, I've decided to keep my auger bit file in my saw till, because when you think auger bits, you think saws, right? Um, the auger bit file looks like this. It has teeth on the face down here, but it has what's known as a safe edge. There are no teeth here. On the opposite end, it has teeth on the edge, but a safe face. And all of my auger bits are currently sharp right now, but let me kind of, pantomime it. I literally, when I was building the workbench up in Maine, I went and resharpened all my auger bits before I went. Let me grab a big one here. Oh, you know what? No, I was gonna say I have a really huge one, but it would take too long to dig it out. So the reason for what you have are the parts here. You've got your lead screw, these little wings, these are called the cutting lips or the cutting, or excuse me, the cutting spurs. They scribe the outer diameter of the hole. And these are the cutting lips. This is what actually cuts and excavates the wood. The spiral, it gets caught in the spiral and it pulls the wood out. So the toothed face, you wanna come in and you can sharpen the inside of that cutting spur. Only sharpen the inside. If you sharpen the outside, you're reducing the diameter of the bit. So in this particular instance, this is a 16 or a one inch bit. If I work out here, I'm changing that. I'm making it, you know, 15 sixteenths or seven eighths or something like that. So you're literally just cutting along here and you're trying to bring this to a point and get that to be sharp. It's pretty straightforward. Just working your way across like that. I like to kind of run the bit down along my wrist so I can kind of lock it in place. And with this hand immobile up against my body, I'm just taking the file to that and sharpening it. Now, the cutting lips, there's a bevel underneath and you would take again the tooth face and I would work from underneath just forming that cutting lip. And here, you can work on the top, but the risk you run of working on the top is if you lower one lip more than the other and they're uneven, it will cut kind of jerky. It won't cut as cleanly as it should. So for the most part, you want to keep these even. If you buy a vintage bit, you want to, you know, sight down them and make sure they're coplanar as much as possible and fix them. Once you get them coplanar, you want to do your sharpening from underneath. And that's the same type of thing. I'll hold it up against my body and just a lot of times you can actually sight down the angle and just work that way. It's not a typically precise thing. Um, 
The bevel angle doesn't really matter here. You just want to get it to a sharp point. Um, as far as maintaining, well, and the reason we have this tooth edge on the smaller bits, sometimes you need to get in here and you're cutting the spurs using the edge. On this bigger bit, I can use the face the whole time. On the smaller bits, you may want to get in here and you can see with the safe face down, I'm not actually cutting into the lips here. I'm only cutting into the spurs. As far as maintaining the lead screw, you want to clean the gunk out of there. And then the best thing you can do, even with a dull lead screw, you generally can get it started and have it drill out the little cone into the wood. Then grab some kind of honing compound. Um, if you have one of those uh, like crayons for a strop, just kind of work some of it in there. Um, and then advance the lead screw into that hole and run it back. Advance it and run it back. Advance it and run it back. And what you're doing is the abrasive in that hole and the threads that you've just cut are now cleaning out, polishing, and sharpening those threads. It only takes like three or four you know, rounds of in and out and in and out and in and out, and you really polish that up very, very quickly. Piece of cake. But if you buy them from Ernie, they will come already set up and already nice and sharp, and all you really have to worry about at that point is the cutting spurs and the cutting lips. But um, auger bits, they're pretty durable. They don't, um, we just don't drill that many holes that you really have to worry about them dulling so quickly. So you can go quite a long time without having to sharpen your auger bits. This is fun, it's rapid fire. <laughs> Blog das Madeiras. I can sharpen a 25 millimeter chisel freehand okay, but four millimeter and six millimeter always get skewed. Any tip? Yeah, don't worry about the skew. Um, certainly having a chisel, that is perfectly square across the surface is nice, but especially when you're getting into these really narrow ones, it's really not super imperative. So um, I will show you how to do it square, but the first thing I wanna tell you is maybe cut yourself some slack. Um, a lot of times if they go slightly off square, it's not the end of the world. Think about when you, you absolutely have to have a perfectly square bottom. If you're chopping out a mortise, which I hope it's a really small mortise with a chisel this small. It doesn't matter whether the floor of that mortise is perfectly square or not. In fact, you probably want to leave it a little bit deeper or the tendon a little bit shorter for just a little bit of squeeze out room. So it doesn't have to be perfectly square there. If you are paring like up against the wall of say a, 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 a tenon or something, you're coming in from the end grain on that tenon, you can skew the chisel to work right up against the end. Um, in fact, a lot of ways, the skew chisel could be really beneficial. Think about if you're cutting in the inside corner of a dovetail, that's why they make skew chisels. So that actually can be beneficial. There are very few examples when you absolutely must have a perfectly square end to a chisel, especially in the smaller guys like this. But um, I don't normally like to sharpen on my workbench because it puts metal swarf and crap on my bench, but I'll just set up something rather than move the camera around here. Just set up something quick, a little marine grade pry wood. This is my final polishing diamond stone. And you said you had trouble with the really small ones, right? 25 mil with four and six always gets cute. Um, this, very much like planing, becomes a matter of, of paying attention. As I do this freehand, I'll come down and I will feel the chisel. Now, I feel the bevel rather. Let me come in a little bit closer. I find that with the narrower chisels actually stepping back from the edge a little, on a wider chisel, a lot of times kind of choke up on it and get down real close to the bevel. Here, I want to be able to feel this a little bit more. There's not a wider reference surface to feel. So pulling back from the blade, it kind of increases that lever action and it, it becomes, it exaggerates the feel of that bevel and it kind of locks in place there. The other thing is if you've got a hollow grind on these smaller chisels, they will lock in place on the bevel a little bit easier. Now, I've got this hand is pretty much doing all the work. The handle is tucked up into my palm here. My finger's firmly pressing down. This finger, these, this hand will come back and kind of act as an outrigger and it's steadying it. So this hand is in line with the chisel and pushing it down. This hand comes in at 90 degrees and what it's trying to do is stabilize it from rocking left to right. 
and I pull back. And on a narrow chisel like this, where I don't have a solid reference surface, I'm only gonna pull back. A lot of times I'll go back and forth and make circles and things like that with wider chisels because it references like it sticks to the wood. Here, where I need to be a little bit more careful, I'm just pulling back and I'm kind of re establishing not establishing, registering that bevel. Every time I come back, I'm kind of rocking and feeling it and again rocking here and letting it lock in on that bevel in two dimensions, both lengthwise and across the blade. Just bringing it back, bringing your hand back and the pressure back away from the blade gives you a lot better feel over things. And then you want to stop and you want to look at that blade. And if you've started to skew it, you'll see the scratch pattern start to change. And you'll see, oh, I'm putting a little bit more pressure one way over the other. So then you need to come back in here and readjust and apply a little bit more pressure on the opposite side that you're skewing. But I think when you put these two fingers in at a 90 degree angle like this, you really can feel if you start to rock one way or another. Moreover, with this hand locked around the handle like this so firmly, you have to really concentrate to twist my wrist to move it off of this. And the minute you start to rock, it becomes very obvious in this hand. So use this little outrigger technique and just kind of take your time. With a chisel this small, there's so little steel being removed here that you really don't have to go fast. It won't take you long to do this at all. There's my burr. Pull that burr off. And we are sharp. So there's the tip. A, cut yourself some slack and realize it doesn't have to be perfectly square. Very, very rarely do you need that chisel to be so perfectly square across the end. And then tip B is two fingers as an outrigger will help really stabilize it and keep it from rocking side to side and skewing the blade. Avraham Pearl, I like that name. How, if you did, fix the mess up you spoke about in Wood Talk? Oh, um, pretty simply. I, I had a, uh, a lid stay in my blanket chest um, and it's pretty much invisible, but um, I needed to cut a mortise, a four and a half inch long mortise. It was about three quarters of an inch deep. I went ahead and chopped it out perfectly square but the hardware actually has rounded ends. It's, it's modern hardware meant to be excavated with a router. So all I did was essentially shape a block. I have some, plenty of that cherry left over. Um, I shaped a block to perfectly, to essentially be the tenon, um, to fit inside there. And I just glued a tenon in place and then went back and drilled two holes from my rounded ends and chopped out in between. So the lid stays actually installed over top of it. When it was installed with square corners, we were talking about an area that was like less than a 32nd of an inch across because the radius really isn't super, super tight on this anyway. So it really was barely noticeable, but I noticed and it was going to bug me. So now that it's been fixed and I plugged that hole, um, you can't even see the patch anymore because all I, it was exactly where it needed to be. But the square tenon that I put in there, the tenon without any shoulder, just kind of flushed it up. It now has completely disappeared. So um, it's installed back there, but you really can't even see it anymore. Uh, I took some video of it um, for the build for the hand tool school, but it was just a matter of filling the mortise with a tenon and then making sure that it was sawn flush and then recutting the whole thing. Um, pretty straightforward. Ray, you've never experienced sitter bits. Buddy, um, go, go watch the video on, on this channel of center bits. It's a good introduction to center bits. I go through several examples where they excel. Um, so awesome. They come in so many different sizes. You really, you must get one. Um, have I considered adding an Amazon Echo? Uh, you know, I've thought about it, but I actually have voice control um, through Siri on my phone. Um, the Philips bulbs have the, what's called the hub that plugs into your router that controls all this stuff. They have, um, they're tied into the Apple, what is it called, HomeKit system. So I can use Siri to change the lights and stuff in my shop. I actually don't do it that often because I've got very specific scenes set up for certain camera angles and things. And I have a smart switch on the wall um, as well as a, a quick link on my phone. So when I, I pull my notifications down, I've got a whole bunch of lighting options right there. And it's literally just, you know, swipe down that menu, tap my, and I go from there. But yeah, um, 
The only thing I worry about having an echo in my shop is that I accidentally order a bunch of stuff without knowing it. Who, airborne, what sizes for gimlets or center bits would you need? I have the one quarter through one inch augers. Um, I mean, again, that's really dependent upon what you're trying to do. Um, center bits, first of all, I don't think anybody is manufacturing modern center bits. You've got to buy them vintage. So what sizes do you need? What sizes can you get? Um, the smallest center bit that I have ever seen is, I believe, a quarter inch. Is that what I have here? Yes. No. Three eighths? Thought I had a smaller one than that. I have, I, for all intents and purposes, a complete set. Yeah, quarter inch on there. And frankly, if you go below a quarter an inch, I think an egg beater drill is more accurate. So, um, Going down to a quarter inch is probably as low as they go. Even then, I'd say a quarter inch is kind of unnecessary. Three eighths might be more appropriate. Um, they get up to like two and three inches wide. This is, gosh, it's so old. I can't see the mark on it. I want to say it's like two and a half. Um, I've got a bigger one that's all rusty that I haven't done anything with. Um, think about what would you be drilling the hole for? Um, 3 8 is pretty good because you can do a lot of 3 8 inch mortises with it, but I wouldn't really use it to drill out a mortise. I would use it maybe for, um, <sighs> again, it's really, really good in thin stocks. If you need to do a cutout, say you were doing a handle, like in this tool tote, so you need to drill a hole here and a hole here and connect them. Um, it's relatively thin stock. This is a three quarter, no, a one inch hole. I used a one inch center bit for that. It's hard to kind of say what sizes do you need because it really depends upon the project you're doing. If you're drilling out a bunch of different peg holes, what size pegs do you normally do, normally use? Um, this really falls into the buy the tool as you need it type situation. Um, but more importantly, center bits are, are not exactly... I don't want to say they're hard to find, but on eBay, you can often get them in huge lots with like a bunch of other bits. So you're getting all kinds of different types of bits. So I have bought many, many a bit just to get that one center bit in an eBay auction. Um, so they're kind of tools of opportunity. You kind of get them as you can, as you can find them and you use them um, when the opportunity arises. And a lot of times you make the size of the bit you have work for the application you're using. It's a little hard to say, by these set. The more I suppose you can slave the bit size to some of the other tools you have like chisels, better off you'll be. But it's, it's a little, little difficult to say in abstract what, what you need. Ooh, David's got a fun question. If you don't have a plow plane or combo plane, how would you do a tug and groove with hand tools? Well, first of all, plow plane is a hand tool. So I would use a plow plane. Um, I would use a saw. Um, a saw and a chisel. If you have a router plane, that would be fantastic. Um, it's a matter of laying out the groove. And again, I would use a mortise gauge or if necessary, use just a single knife gauge and work it from both sides. So you've got a knife line to find the extents of that groove. Then I would come in with the chisel and create that little V cut usually works better to actually go with the grain and cutting that out. Sometimes bevel down can be a little bit safer and you're just running down the inside of the groove and peeling that out so that it gives you something on which to start your saw. Let me get a little bit closer here. And you're going to start on the side nearest to you and start cutting and slowly start extending that saw cut out. And you can work this way down the board to the point where eventually you've got a cut and you can actually start running the full length. You can also just chop it out if that's what, if you're uncertain with your sawing skills, there's nothing to say you can't just chop it out. Um, I find that sawing actually ends up being faster. This is going to be tedious work no matter how you look at it, but you certainly can chop your way down 
leading with the bevel, just like this, where a big giant mortise and chop your way down there. But again, having the extents of that already laid out could be really helpful. But that's gonna require chopping all the way along that length, and that's a heck of a lot, especially if you've got multiple tongue grooves to do. I find that the saw will go a lot faster because once you've got the lines sunk, you can literally come in and start splitting it out. Bevel down because the handle will get in the way, and you just kind of work your way along, and it starts splitting the wood away very quickly. You can even grab a chisel and it works along the groove. You can see where I cut it already. If you have the router plane, then you can come in and you can flatten out the bottom of that groove and you can dial in an exact depth. If you don't have the router plane, it becomes a little bit more difficult because you, again, you're working with the chisel and you need to be constantly checking with the depth stop to do this. It is tedious. It would be very tedious. If you are in a situation where you have a lot of tongue and groove joinery to do, you might want to think about getting a plow plane um, because you could certainly do it, um, but you're going to find it to be a lot more difficult. The, the tongue, on the other hand, is just two rabbits. Um, so if you have a rabbit plane, use the rabbit plane. If you don't, again, you can saw the extents and you can even saw from the other side and pop out that little, that little block that you just cut out of there. Or a lot of times I will saw um, one of the face, usually the, the wider face, and I can come in and just pop the wood out uh, with a chisel. That's a lot faster because you're not working inside the confines of a groove. You're removing wood from around essentially a tenon, so it can be sawed very much the same way. Regardless, it's tedious work. There's no question. Um, I wouldn't want to do it. I'm trying to think, I've, I've done this before in a demo once, and it was like a short little board, and it was just a demo. I don't think that in practice I would really want to do that. Um, there's just the the it's 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 inefficient at best. Oh boy. Um, what is the best smoother? Three, four, or four and a half? Three. <laughs> Again, it's an arbitrary question. Um, no, no, it's not. No, it's not. A smoothing plane, it's meant to make stuff pretty, right? So it's not about making things flat. It's a making it pretty. It's eliminating tear out, preparing it for finish. If you have a number three, actually the best smoothing plane is a number two. Number three will work. Number three, number two. I actually prefer my number two because it's cool. But the shorter sole will ride over those hills and valleys. So if you've got a little bit of tear out or a little spot that needs to be cleaned up, you're going to get to it a lot easier with a smaller plane, whether it be the number three or the number two, than you would with even the bigger plane. I, there's something to be said about greater mass in a smoothing plane. But unless you're working with really, really difficult jungle woods with really, really interlocked grain, I think, I don't want to say the mass thing is overrated, but it's just something that's so specific for the average project and the average wood that it's really not necessary. So if you're looking to get your first smoothing plane or looking for kind of an all around smoothing plane, you're better off with just a standard small number three. Number two, I like, but I mean, my hands are pretty big and it is, I end up gripping it more like a block plane than a traditional plane, uh, toted plane. So you may find the number three to be a little bit more ergonomic in use. Um, the heavy mass and things that comes with like the bronze number fours or um, like this, I call this my, my Veritas bevel up. I call this my polishing plane because it's got the high angle blade in there. It's super heavy, super massive. This is the stuff that I use on woods that are really, really difficult. And I mean really, really difficult. Um, can you guys see this blanket chest in the back? I don't know if you can see the figure from there, but go to my Instagram page and you'll see the crazy figure in this thing. It, it was done with a regular old smoothing plane. I used actually that number two and I used my, uh, my number four on it. Just a matter of a tight mouth and a sharp blade to handle the intense figure of that curly cherry. Um, Maple is always a pain in the butt to hand plane. So maybe there's an instance where um, 
you want a more dedicated smoother, but I still think adjusting the, the bevel angle will be better off than a heavy, massive plane. So I don't agree with a four and a half at all. I'm not, not a fan of that bigger blade. Some people like it because you have interchangeable blades. I like a much smaller wheelbase when it comes to a smoothing plane. But this is all opinion, folks. There's a lot of people who are gonna say something totally different on that whole thing. How do you make a good mallet? Can you put leather on the head so you can use it on your wood without bruises? Um, you know, I've done all of, the, all of the above. You can have just a plain old wooden head. It all becomes a matter of what is the relative hardness of the wood, in this case beech, to the wood that you're hammering. This is uh, teak. Teak is softer than beech, so I may have a more tendency to dent the wood using a harder mallet. Um, this is maple, same thing, maple's harder than teak. But you're not, when you're using a mallet, rarely are you really walloping with the thing. Um, chisel or mortising, and mortising chisels is probably the most aggressive I'm ever gonna get with a mallet. And that's about as aggressive as I'm gonna get. That was wood to wood contact right there. Um, if you really have to hammer hard on a chisel, you're asking the chisel to do more than you should. What's happening is you're driving the wedge in too deep. And if you've ever had a, a mortise chisel kind of freeze in the cut, you've probably driven it in too deep. You've asked the wedge to work too hard. And that's how you end up damaging both the handle, the mallet, or the project itself. Um, far too many people swing far too hard with their mallets. I actually have been using a metal mallet. This is a Shenandoah Two Works mallet for a long time. I've been testing a three pound behemoth made by the same guys for a while. This is a prototype. That's why it's not as shiny and pretty as this. Um, and I love this thing. Um, but when I'm using it, oops, I just put the chisel away. Again, I'm not getting a heavier mallet because I want to swing it harder. In fact, I'm actually really choking up on the handle and I'm letting the mass do all the work. So I'm not having to come back at all. I'm just, and I find that it's actually more precise this way because the more I've got to move my hand, the more I can, I can shift things back and forth. So I can just set this right over top and almost just let it fall on the chisel. And I'm getting the same depth of cut as I was with the wooden mallet. So in this case, it's metal to wood and everybody's like, oh my God, that's terrible. So in, a, in reference to maybe putting leather on it, it may not be that necessary. If you're using your mallet to assemble things, like tap together dovetails, then yes, a leather face can be a good thing because you don't wanna bruise those dovetails as you tap it together. Um, I, I just got this recently. It's a totally unnecessary purchase, but I like Dave Jeske and I wanna support him. This is a blue spruce mallet. So it's got a wood face on one side and leather on the other side. So that's one thing you can do. And this is the side that I use for assembly is I'm pounding uh, dovetails together, assembling a case. Um, occasionally as I'm tapping um, mortise and tenons together. But for the most part, when I'm doing joinery, I'm using those metal head mallets. I feel I've got a little bit more bang for the buck. Um, I don't have to swing it as hard. I'm not having to um, make long strokes with it. This little guy is fantastic. I was doing... What was I doing? I was installing the lock mortise on that chest last night and you have to flip the chest forward um, on its face and I've got this 18 inch space in between to work with the chisel and chisel out the lock mortise. So imagine I only had about maybe that much space to move the chisel before I was hitting the top. I didn't want to start bruising the top. So I choked up on it. I was holding the actual head of the mallet itself and just tapping it and I was able to excavate that mortise in very tight confines with this um, heavy headed mallet. If I tried to use this guy, it wouldn't work. I could maybe turn it on its side, but I still have to, it's got to hit with a little bit more force to get the same oomph as this heavier metal headed mallet. So I, I'm actually a proponent of the, the metal heads unless you are doing assembly work, in which case make a mallet and put a strip of leather on one side and leave it wood on the other, but you wanna use a relatively hard wood that is not prone to splitting. So a diffuse porous wood like maple works really well. If you can grab a hunk of lignum vitae, hey, go for it. 
The very first uh, carver's mallet that I turned to my lathe is made out of lignum vitae. Um, I've since given it to a, a student, so I don't have it anymore. Um, Pat, yes, I think I missed your question. If it wasn't in caps, I probably scrolled right over it. Let me see if I can find you here. I don't see you. Have you restated the question below, maybe? If you, if you haven't, why did you skip my question? I, 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 I don't see it. So uh, please ask it again. Put it in all caps. I just, sorry, it's, there's so much going on right now, it's hard to see what's, what's happening. So uh, anybody who, it looks like if I've missed multiple questions, please um, restate them. <laughs> no offense, offense is intended. I probably just missed it because I'm just going from bold type to bold type here. Um, uh, Lloyd wants to know if I wear the unwaxed or waxed apron. This is unwaxed. When I bought this from Jason, he wasn't doing waxed yet. Um, my auger bit roll is waxed canvas. This is one of the first ones. Actually, when I was teaching in San Marcos, Texas, um, Jason came down to meet me um, and I specifically wore my apron. This is probably, I don't know, Jason, if you're ever watching this, I want to say this was amongst the first five or 10 aprons that he made. So it was really early on, but he was just starting to play with wax canvas and I immediately told him I need one of these. This is fantastic. You want to talk about maintaining your auger bits, put it on a wax canvas roll. You never have to worry about rust. It's fantastic. Um, where do you source leather for a shop like uh, Vice Jaws? Um, I've been getting my leather, let's see, the leather on my leg vise, I picked it up at Michael's Craft Store. Um, the leather for, well, the leather for my moxin vise came from Benchcrafted. The leather I've been using for my holdfasts, this is all that's left of it. This is a thick, um, it's like 3 16 it's almost a quarter of an inch thick. I picked this up from McMaster Car, um, McMaster.com, I think is their website. They sell leather there. Um, you can buy leather belting material at McMaster Car, but this came in a, in a like, I want to say like a 10 by 10 square. And I've slowly been chopping things out and gluing them to my um, holdfasts. The leather on my big monster saw vise came from um, like Hobby Lobby, I think, because I was able to buy a long strip of it. But you can also buy long strips of leather um, at McMaster Car. So, um, the leather jaws on my ram tang came oh, from McMaster Car. This is actually sold as belting leather, like machine belting leather. So you can see long and thin, and it runs the full like 30, what is this, 30, 32 inch length. And it was the exact same, exact size that I needed. Um, just glued it on there. It all came from McMaster Car. Good stuff. You can actually buy strapping material from McMaster Car as well. Hey, thanks for coming out, Tyler. I probably missed you, but I appreciate you saying goodbye. Um, getting into tool making after making my saws and hollows and rounds. Any tips for getting my products tested? Starting to sell tools. Wow. Um, I have never sold the tool, so I may not be the person to ask for that. As far as getting your products tested, I don't think you will have any problem finding people who want to test your tools. Um, I have people who send me tools all the time to test them. Um, when I do, uh, I usually will do videos because most people like to, to see them, but I will not do a video on a tool uh, unless I've had a significant amount of time to work with it. Um, other than saying, hey, I just got this tool, I'm going to be testing it. Like I did a video last week where I mentioned a couple tools that I would be testing. I won't form an opinion until I've had a long time to work with it. But I also am very clear to say to people, hey, you know, I, I can't guarantee I'm going to do a video on this. So by sending a tool to somebody, you know, certainly they will give you your feedback, but it's never, don't, don't necessarily expect a guarantee that that person's going to then start, you know, publicizing it. Um, I shouldn't say that. There's a lot of people who do it. I would say if you have made a tool that you're particularly proud of, YouTube is a great place to go. You can find a lot of people who um, uh, would be willing to, to test it for you. That shouldn't be any issue. As far as selling it, I would advise you to talk to somebody who's already selling tools to, to give you some tips there. Certainly there's plenty of info on the internet about how to price it and 
things like that. Getting into a local show, getting hooked up with Lee Nielsen, one of their hand tool events, probably be a good way to go. Um, ultimately, if you've created a good tool that works really well, that has the, the nice features, people will talk it up. And if you've gotten like YouTubers or whatever to test it, um, more than likely, if they like it, they're going to want to talk about it. And that can be the way to get started in selling them. But again, I've never sold the tool before, so <laughs> I may not be the guy to ask. How flat need to be a 16-inch hood plane? I don't know what a hood plane is. Blog das Medeiros. How flat? Um, I guess he's asking how flat the sole needs to be. Um, <laughs> I hate to answer questions this way, but it depends. It depends on how you're going to use it. A 16 inch plane is generally like a jack plane in length, maybe even a four plane. If you're using it as a four plane, I don't care how flat it is because it's going to take such a heavy shaving. It doesn't matter. The flatness of the sole is directly related to the thickness of the shaving. So if you're going to take a smoothing plane shaving, you know, that's a thousandth of an inch, the sole needs to be flat to within a thousandth of an inch along its length. That's very, very flat. There's no plane that I know of that needs to be that flat. Joiner plane, 22 inches long, I'm not gonna be taking a thousandth of an inch shaving. I'm gonna be taking maybe five, six thousandths on the small end. More than likely, I'll be upwards of 10, 15 thousandths of an inch thick shaving. So the sole needs to be flat to within 10 thousandths of an inch along the 22 inch length of the blade. It needs to be mostly flat right around the blade at the toe and the heel. There can be little divots in between that area. So it all depends upon how you're going to use the plane as to how thick it need, how flat it needs to be. If you're using that 16 inch plane as a jack plane, it could be used for both thin shavings and thicker shavings. You might want it super, super flat. So you can use it like a smoothing plane. But again, the longer that sole, the harder it's going to be to work as a smoothing plane. Go back to my earlier comment about how a smoothing plane, I want it to be a little bit shorter. So um, the flatness, put it this way, the, the planes that come out of Lee Nielsen and Lee Valley are so much flatter than they ever need to be. Bless them. It's awesome that they do that, but it just does not need to be that flat. Think about the function of it. Thickness of the shaving directly relates to how flat that sole needs to be. All right. Um, Pat, did you restate your question? Because I missed it earlier, I want to get to it because I'm, I'm pretty much out of time here. I'm thinking he wants to know about sharpening a timber slick. Um, I would sharpen the exact same way I would sharpen a chisel. It's just a big ass chisel. Um, this is as close as I have in my shop to a timber slick. Uh, it's a two and a half inch paring chisel. How I sharpen it, you've got a big ass long bevel. Generally, the bevel on a timber slick is a lot lower than your average bench chisel. Because of that, you've got a huge reference surface. So I would, again, hollow grind that. And much like I was showing with the auger bit where I kind of lock the tool up against my body, I'm doing the same thing here. On my stone, I've got the handle running all the way up here, but I'm actually choking up on a little bit more and I'm pressing the handle against my forearm. So I'm firmly registered. And a lot of times I'll even come back with my other hand and hold the chisel here. So it, the, now this big giant mass of steel is an extension of my arm because that bevel is so ginormous. And if you're doing like a 20 degree bevel, not only will it be wide, it will be long because a lot of steel there. Um, if you will feel that bevel so easily, and then it becomes more of a step back as you pull that along the blade. Rather than trying to move this with your arm, you wanna keep this arm relatively straight. And again, if I'm gripping the handle back here, I'm stepping back and pulling the chisel back. Coming back, feeling the bevel, and stepping back. Um, there's a lot of, of grinding that kind of goes in initially to get the bevel set, unless you bought it, say, from like bar timber frame or something like that. But it's, it's sharpened exactly the same way as you would a normal bench chisel. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's easier because there is so much reference steel. Um, in some ways, it's harder because there's so much reference steel that it takes longer to sharpen. But it's definitely not hard to register that bevel and feel that bevel. So I hope that was your question, Pat. I wanted to make sure that I answered it because if you asked it earlier, and I'm just a big softy that way. 
James wants to know if I can discuss making replacement blades for Stanley 80. Sorry, my window is in the way here. Here we go. For Stanley 80 as well as uses of this plane. Isn't the Stanley 80 a cabinet scraper? Sorry guys, I'm terrible when it comes to plane numbers. I so rarely pay attention to that, but isn't the number 80 the cabinet scraper? The number 80 cabinet scraper? Um, I use it primarily for killing the glue line on a panel. If I've glued up a panel, I would grab my number 80 and just wipe away the glue. Um, it's a little sometimes harsh depending on the glue I'm using to buy blade, but it does a great job of quickly getting rid of the glue and then leveling any inconsistencies of the glue joint. It can also then be refined to take a really fine shaving. I don't particularly like using a cabinet scraper for fine finishing or tough grain. I would much prefer to use a card scraper for that. I've got absolute surgical precision with a card scraper and I can spot plane little areas of tear out. Whereas the cabinet scraper is limited to the sole size. So again, like the smoothing plane, it will ride up and down those hills and valleys, but it's not going to be nearly as pinpoint as a card scraper. So when it comes to smoothing and dealing with tear out, card scraper I find to be so much more effective than a cabinet scraper. And I use the cabinet scraper primarily for um, leveling actions for the same reason that it's got that small sole and can get into those nooks and crannies and can quickly level out odd spots. It's much less of a finishing tool. As far as um, making a replacement blade, to be honest, I don't know that I would make a replacement blade. There's so many vintage cabinet scrapers out there, you could probably buy a vintage blade for pennies. Um, Contact Liberty Tool up in Maine, they have a website, and they've got hundreds of replacement parts for planes. Guarantee you they'll have a cabinet scraper. Or you can go and buy a relatively inexpensive one from Crown. This is a spoke shave blade, but they have cabinet scraper blades as well. This is a Kuntz, not Crown. A Kuntz blade. I'm actually, I bought this to create a scratch stock. Um, so, well, it comes in two blades, so I used one of them. But you can buy cabinet scraper blades, and they're like super cheap. So, I mean, if you wanted to make your own, to say that you've made your own, it'd be a matter of buying some tool steel and, you know, doing the whole tempering process and everything. But I, I think that might be a bit extreme, in my opinion. But I'm not a big fan. I'm a fan of tool makers <laughs> and using their tools. I'm not really a, somebody that uses tools a lot. Um, Steven says, Tandy leather is a good place. I agree. I have not personally used it, but I know hundreds of people who have, and I keep meaning to look them up. But yeah. How do you know when a dovetail saw needs to be sharpened? It starts to growl more than slice. Um, you will start to see more tear out on the back side of the cut. Um, you get more blowout. You're always going to see a little bit of blowout, but a fine pitch saw shouldn't blow out that much. It'll start to blow out and get fuzzy on the back side of the cut. And the pitch of the cut will actually sound a little bit deeper. I studied music, so I'm very oral focused on a lot of this stuff. But you'll hear it kind of makes this growly, vibrating noise. This goes with any saw, but especially a fine pitch saw like a dovetail saw, it makes very little noise as you make that cut. It will start to get very loud and you feel it vibrate a lot more in your hand. But the visual one is the tear on the back side of the cut with really any saw, but especially a fine pitch saw, it becomes very obvious. All right. I've got... I show, oh, is there more than that? I show one more question here. So I will answer that and then call it a night because it's been more than an hour. What are your thoughts on Lee Nielsen panel saws? Lee Nielsen makes great panel saws. Do you need a panel saw? If you guys have heard me say this before, I apologize. Little lesson in semantics. A panel saw is not a hand saw. Panel saw, by definition, is a saw that is around 18 to 24 inches long. It will be a finer pitch saw. A panel saw is meant for working on already surfaced panels. Generally, less than an inch thick, around three quarters of an inch thick is where they're usually used. So if I have glued up a panel and I've already milled it flat and now I need to size it, um, maybe I'm doing a frame and panel assembly, I've done all the, the sizing, I want to get it down to final size before I raise the panels. I will use a fine pitched, in this case, this is a 10 points per inch cross cut panel saw. It is 19 inches long. Again, it's actually, no, I'm sorry, it's 11 points per inch. This is a panel saw. 
A hand saw is a backless saw that is 26 to maybe 30 inches long. Generally 26 to 28 is what you normally see. These are gonna be pitched more aggressively. This is a cross cut hand saw. It is pitched at eight points per inch and it is 26 inches long. A panel saw is not a generic name for a backless saw. A panel saw is a very specific type of backless saw. They were often renamed um, in the 50s toolbox saws because the shorter length of the saw allows it to fit in a toolbox. I have a rip panel saw. This saw is 10 points per inch. This saw is 24 inches long. This is pretty much the same geometry and size of the Lee Nielsen panel saws. They are great saws, good handle design, good steel. They work great, they function great. They are not a substitute for a rough cut saw. If you're gonna be using a hand saw to break down your rough saw and lumber, you went to the lumber yard, you went to Home Depot or whatever, you wanted to break it down, you're gonna want an eight points per inch cross cut saw and a five points per inch ish rip saw. If you can't have both, get yourself the rip saw because uh, it's gonna cut a lot faster. They are not meant for heavily, heavily precise work. They're meant for breaking stuff down, quickly getting through the wood. That's what it's for. The panel saws are gonna be a lot slower in cutting, but they're gonna leave a much cleaner surface. So you can cut right to your line and clean it up with maybe one or two plane passes and be good to go. Hand saw is gonna leave a rougher cut. It's gonna take a little bit more planing to clean it up. So you might wanna step a little bit further away from your final line or not even worry about the line because you're just cross-cutting to break things down to size. So I have no problem whatsoever with Lee Nielsen panel saws. What I have a problem with is when people buy a panel saw meaning to use it for their rough work and they get frustrated. And that's where the whole perception that hand sawing is slow comes from. Don't get me wrong. It's not like it's as fast as some power tools, but you'd be surprised how fast hand sawing can be when you choose the right pitch for the job. Panel saws, no. Rough saw material, they are so slow in rough saw material. Get yourself a real hand saw and not worry about that. So, so Tim McCoy below says, thoughts? I have lots of thoughts. Um, depends on what thoughts you want me to have. Um, all right. Why would a saw cut a curved kerf? And what's one project I wanted to do but haven't been able to do yet? Those are the last two questions. Uh, I'll answer the last one first because that's really easy because I wanted to do this and I've been stuck on finding hardware. I mentioned on Wood Talk, I want to build a Titanic steamer chair. But at the time, um, what was it? Norm did an episode in the New Yankee Workshop where he built one. And he worked with Rockler at the time for that hardware. Rockler no longer carries that. And I have not been able to find anyone who carries that steamer chair hardware nor have I been able to get my hands on a steamer chair in order to examine the hardware. I, can't, I have lots of people I know who could probably reproduce it if I knew what I was looking at, but I haven't gotten a good look at the steamer hardware. I even bought the plans that the UNK Workshop sold, but there's no picture of the hardware anywhere. So I don't really know what it is I need in order to have it reproduced. I, I probably could spend some time figuring it out. Um, and at some point when I find some free time, when I clone myself, I will do that. And I want to build one of those steamer chairs. They're so super comfortable. It's a nice complex project and it is just something that I really, really, really want to build. And now, why would a saw cut a curved kerf? More than likely, you have a bit of a bend in the saw plate. It may not be a dramatic bend, but a lot of times what happens is you get this just, and this happened on this saw, just that last tooth. Can I get it edge on and get it to focus? Just this last tooth is tweaked off to the side. It's not really picking it up, is it? But everything else is straight. When I sight down this saw, it is straight, except for that little tweak at the end. And a lot of times that can be just enough to throw the saw off or pull the saw to one side or another and cause you to start to curve one way or another. Nine times out of 10 though, it is a set issue. And you can stone it to kind of remove set from one side or the other. You just have to make sure you're stoning it from the right side. Sometimes you're actually better off adding more set, but you can also get in trouble very quickly here because then you start to widen the curve even more and you get what's known as a drunken saw curve where the curve is so much wider than the plate that as you saw, the saw kind of sways from side to side like a drunk and then it starts to curve even more. So 
If you're still getting problems, I would recommend doing your best to remove all the set. Um, joint the saw like two or three times, get a good flat on top, then go back and reshape those teeth and resharpen those teeth to get a point. That's gonna remove a lot of that set. So you can stone it all day long and all you're gonna do is thin out the teeth. Your best bet is to joint it and thin the teeth vertically, reshape, resharpen, and then don't do any setting and start working with it there. And then see, see you know, how much set is left. You're probably gonna to need to set a little bit more. Um, then very, as little set as you can get away with, set every, every other tooth and go back and set, in other words, set every tooth in the appropriate direction. So set every other tooth this way and then go back and set every other tooth the opposite way as little as you can. So now you know that you at least have an even amount of set all the way along and the saw should cut straight. If it's still cutting a little bit curved, now you can start to selectively add a little bit more set. So if it's curving to the right, what I wanna do is throw more teeth to the left so it steers it back in. But what I would do is start by throwing maybe a tooth at the toe, a tooth in the middle, and a tooth in the back, tiniest bit more to the left and see how that works. If I still need more, then I would set kind of a tooth in between. So I did toe, middle, and end, then I would do kind of in between the middle and the end and in between, so now I've got what is that, five teeth set to one side. It doesn't take much, nor does it take a lot of set to do it. But sometimes there's something so wonky that it's hard to diagnose and you need to hit the reset button, remove the set, reshape the teeth and start over. Because um, the, the, you may not be able to figure it out and it's so much, um, it's, it's diminishing returns. That's the word I was going for. The more you add, you may be introducing more problems than you're fixing them. All right. That's it for me, guys, except for the fact that um, this last question is easy. How much taller is my joiner bench than my workbench? Um, my workbench is 33 inches high. My joiner bench is 45 inches high. As far as the difference, do the math, but it's more about elbow height and palm height for me. That's how I would determine them. Cool? That was fun. <laughs> there was no time for conversation because it was all lightning round, but that was still a lot of fun. If I missed anybody's question, I apologize. You can always email me and I will happily answer it um, in an email format. Otherwise, everybody, you have a great night.